remind the people who are over here, and we have our eminent faculty, Professor Wasim Jafri, Professor Saeed Hamid, Professor Masood Siddi. We have Professor Arif, Am Arif Amir Nawaz here, Professor Abrar Sheikh with us over here, and lots of other people with us. And just for the audience, this is a three-day meeting, and starting from today till 13th of December. And uh, this meeting is actually, this year, the theme is Quick Decisions in Hepatology, and it consists of 14 symposia, and a very large group of 135 world-renowned uh, faculties and experts are contributing as chairs, as speakers, and the moderators. And not only this, there are so many other exciting activities for the trainees and the fellows and other scholars, which includes free paper presentations, poster sessions, invest young investigator sessions, rising star session, quiz competition, and so on. So be with us for next three days and get yourself updated about uh, the various diseases of uh, liver diseases. Um, so from here, without any further delay, we will move to our first symposium, which is um, a very exciting symposium about EUS in hepatology. And I am now introducing Dr. Adil Rahman, who's a consultant gastroenterologist at Aachen University and Hospital. And uh, he will be moderating this session. Dr. Adil Rahman. Assalamualaikum. Um, morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all on today's uh, first symposium, and this is a, a very unique symbol, uh, um, uh, symposium. Has an agenda in it, and uh, in earlier this year, this concept was uh, uh, discussed with Professor Zagam Obas, and he was the one who approached me, and then we conceptualized this uh, symposium. And with the help of Dr. Chris, we uh, contacted different faculties, distinguished faculties from all around the world, from Singapore, from Thailand, and uh, especially from San Francisco, the true masters of EUS, both Ken's, uh, Professor Kenneth Chang and Professor uh, Ken Binbola. They will be speaking on the EUS in hepatology this session, and um, it's something very unique. And I think for the first time in the hepatology conference, the EUS is being blended to, um, uh, with the EUS. So first of all, I will introduce the session's uh, chair. And there are three chairs in this session, at, and the first chair is Professor Christopher Kaur from Singapore. And for the local audience, um, in endoscopy, Dr. Chris do everything. He's the master of EUS, ERCP, EMR, ESD, full thickness resection, POEM, and also do the endoscopic stretching. and. Uh, pardon me, Dr. Chris, if I miss something. So um, he is from Singapore General Hospital, uh, is Vice President for GI Asia Pacific Task Force and EUS type as well. So he's the first chair. The second chair will be uh, Professor Wasim Jafri. He is the pioneer of gastroenterology in Pakistan, also the founding president of PSSLD, patron in chief as well. And he, uh, he's the professor of hepatology and gastroenterology in Aachen Hospital in the Department of Medicine as well. The third chair will be Professor Nantli from Bangkok, Thailand. She's from Sri Raj. She's also Vice President of Tej, Thai Association of Gastroenterology and Endoscopy. And she will be the chair. And um, let me see if Dr. Chris is online. So I will request first Dr. Chris to uh, go uh, through the first agenda, which will be the talk from Dr. Damien. So Dr. Chris will be joining us to introduce the first uh, speaker of this session. Can we have Dr. Chris? Uh, as an admin. Good morning, Dr. Chris. So, um, uh, in this session, there will be four, uh, by the time Dr. Chris joins, there will be four talks. First talk will be on EUS and hepatologies. The second one will be interventions, uh, vascular interventions in the EUS. The third will be uh, endohepatology. That will be from Professor Kenneth Chang. And uh, this will be a new paradigm. Uh, the, the, this talk will be uh, on on that. And the last one will be EUS guided liver biopsy, EUS LB. So, hi, Dr. Chris. Good morning. Good to see you. Yes, uh, you can unmute yourself. Yep. Yep, uh, we can hear you. So, I just introduced. Yep. So, you can go through the agenda, the first talk of Dr. Damien. Yep. Uh, in introduction of the first speaker and then take over. Yeah. Okay, so um, if, uh, it, it's my pleasure to, to be here uh, this morning, uh, you know, sharing this the, the stage with uh, uh, some very very eminent speakers. But the, the first of uh, which uh, is, is Dr. Damien Tan, my colleague at Singapore General Hospital. 
Bull. He's the, uh, uh, the current director of the endoscopy centers here. Uh, we work very, very closely. He's really a, a, an excellent endoscopist, very, very passionate about, about pan pan pancreatic disease, and will lead the pancreatic uh, center here when, when established uh, soon. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let me just uh, hand the uh, microphone over to him to, to do his talk on uh, uh, U.S. Uh, liver anatomy. Uh, over, over to you, Damien. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. I think, good morning. Thank you to the organizers, PSSLD, for inviting me to this prestigious meeting. Today's topic will be on U.S. anatomy of the liver. As introduction, a radiological description of liver segment has been standardized. Endoscopic ultrasound provides a different perspective of liver anatomy. The images acquired are slightly different compared to computed tomography and transabdominal ultrasound and requires three dimensional conceptualization of the liver parenchyma. US gutted interventions of the livers are becoming more common. And these interventions include fine needle injections and liver biopsies, tumor ablative therapies, vascular interventions, as well as complex transhepatic biliary drainage procedures. Thus, detailed knowledge about EUS liver segmentation and anatomy will be increasingly needed as a basic roadmap for these interventions. Here is a nice diagram from Sharma et al. which shows the segments of the liver each independent of its own vascular inflow, outflow, and biliary drainage. The segments are referred to by number or by names. The numbering of the segments is done in a clockwise manner, starting from segment 1, the caudate lobe, and going out to segment 2 and 3 and 4, which belong to the left hemi liver, and followed by segment 5, 6, and 8, which belong to the right hemi liver. This is a nice slide from Bhatti et al., which shows the landmark structures for EUS description of liver anatomy. The landmark structures together with their imaging features can be seen, but more importantly, the relevant structures for Anderson Grofer include that of the main portal vein radicals and segmental branches, the left hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, the ligamentum venosum, the ligamentum teres, as well as the gallbladder, falciform ligament, and the liver hilum. Moving on to imaging, we image from the left lobe first. The EUS scope is first introduced beyond the G and the probe faces anteriorly towards the left lobe if the scope shaft is straight. The scan plane is directed anteriorly towards the left lobe at the beginning and it sweeps progressively with a clockwise rotation from planes A to D in this way and from planes 1 to 4. Here is a cutaway schematic showing the EUS imaging with the probe over in this region and we can assess all the structures in the left lobe easily from this position. And here is what it would look like on fluoroscopy with the probe facing the left lobe anteriorly. Step 1. How we evaluate the left lateral segments to evaluate segments 2 and 3 first. We can see that this is a scanning plane and if you were to move clockwise, you'll be able to assess segment 2 and 3 over here, first with their respective portal vein radicals, and the left hepatic vein can be seen in the longitudinal orientation. Here is the images from the EUS perspective. We have segment 2, which is closest to the probe, which is then divided by the left hepatic vein, and you can see segment 3. And these are the portal vein branches of segment 2. Here's a video image. The next step is to identify the umbilical part of the left portal vein and the ligament teres, which is the remnant of the obliterated fetal umbilical vein. On EUS, the ligament teres is seen as a hyperechoic band extending from the umbilical part of the left portal vein. This is the left portal vein giving out P2, the umbilical portion is here, and P3, and this is the ligamentum 
theories, which is a very important structure that we need to identify. In the perspective of the planes, is in the plane B, if we are further clockwise talking our scope, we move from segment two and three to see this plane, which is basically looking at the umbilical portion of the portal vein, as well as the ligamentum teres. And this is looking from the axial view. These are the structures we need to see. Here's the EUS view. As you can see, we have moved away from segment two and three, and we can now identify the umbilical portion of the left portal vein, and this hyperechoic white band, which is the ligamentum teres. It extends to the inferior liver surface from the umbilical portion of the left portal vein. Next to it, we can see there is also the left hepatic artery. Is there any audio? With slight further clockwise, the next step is to identify the medial segment of the left lobe. And over here, we can see the scanning plane has moved more clockwise. And we are going to start to identify other structures such as the ligamentum venosum and have better views of the S1. On the axial view, you can see we are moving in a clockwise fashion. So clockwise rotation of the probe which start to show the umbilical portion of the left portal vein. And now we can see it starts to see the S4 is bordered by the concavity of the arching of the umbilical part of the left portal vein on the left side and the middle hepatic vein on the right side. This is the segment four. And when you have the middle hepatic vein coming downwards, you further divide the segment four from the segment eight. This corresponds to the area between the falciform ligament as well as the gallbladder as seen on the liver surface. And the S4 extends over the front of the left hilum towards the S1. And this is the USU showing S1 over here, S4 over here. The ligamentum venosum is the obliterated ductus venosus which shunts blood from the left umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava until birth. It runs from the angle between the transverse and umbilical part of the left portal vein to the IVC. At the drainage of the left hepatic vein as well as the middle hepatic vein. The ligamentum venosum separates S1 from the rest of the liver, S2 to the left, as well as S4 to the front. And to the right posteriorly, the S1 is bounded by the IVC, which is behind over here. And on EUS, the ligamentum venosum is seen as a thick hypercoic band between S1 under the probe and S4, which is deep to it. This is the scanning planes as we previously shown, we, we are now clockwise talk. We can see ligamentum venosum here. And this is a structure we want to identify so that we can see S1 and S4 better. As you can see, this is the white band as described earlier, a thick hyperechoic band demarcating the S1 or the caudate lobe with the S4 deep to it. And deep to it, you can see the middle hepatic vein, which further separates S4 from S8. Here's a video showing the S. Moving on, we now try to identify the IVC and the right liver lobe from the stomach. 
this is a further clockwise rotation and we can see that the IVC is better seen now. And we can see if in the same axle view how we can see the IVC. This is the US image of the IVC in the right lobe of the liver from the stomach. We can see that the middle hepatic vein will from S8. And as a plane rotates over the middle hepatic vein, we can see the S8, which is deeper, and you can start to see part of the IVC. However, the right lobe of the liver is generally not well seen, and only the nearer parts can be seen, and the further parts of the S8 may not be seen so well. If the probe is rotated further and withdrawn, the IVC now comes into view, which is much easier seen, and we can start to see the S1. And this is what a fluoroscopic image would look like with the US probe as it's straightened out and withdrawn slowly towards the IVC. Here's the video showing the images as just described. We can see the main portal vein, the right portal vein, the S1, as well as the IVC here, and the middle hepatic vein coming out from the IVC. And this is divide segment 4 from segment 8. One. The next step is the evaluation of the liver hilum from the stomach. These are the views that we want to obtain with our scope looking in the liver hilum on fast or with the upward scope tip deflection to give different views. Over here, you can see the hilum the liver from below. As behind, as far the probe can be seen. And as you push the probe in, we can get a portal vein trunk in longitudinal orientation from the stomach. And the bile duct will be behind it. And the cystic duct will be also seen below the bile duct. And the gallbladder will be below that further. Further clockwise, we'll be able to see more structures. Over here, we can see the gallbladder as we go further in. You can see that the segment 5 is next to the gallbladder, and this is an image of the diaphragm, which is seen as a thickened white band. And here are the images, liver hilum, and we can see that this is the left portal vein, and we will be moving clockwise, and we can start to see the left portal vein coming out to the main portal vein and the right portal vein. And we can see that here's the left hepatic artery, which follows the transverse part of the left portal vein. Here we can see now as we further towards the right lobe of the liver. As you can see, our probe is facing upwards. This Here's the planes that we would like to see. You can see the bile duct here. As we're going anticlockwise, we start to see the portal veins spreading into the right portal vein as well as the left portal vein, and this is segment 4. Here we can see the GDA, the common hepatic artery, and the common inhabited artery is seen to indent on the portal vein as it crosses it. And this will give rise to the portal proper hepatic artery, which will then give rise to the right hepatic artery and the left hepatic artery. And this is the GDA. Here we can see, looking at the plane of the gallbladder, you can see that there will be a segment 4, which is next to the gallbladder. This is our probe looking upwards. And this is when we do it counterclockwise. The gallbladder is situated in the inferior aspect of the liver between S4 and S5. And usually the hepatic parenchymus is seen below from gallbladder from the dental bulb is S4. Further counterclockwise rotation scans higher into the liver hilum, the scanning plane gradually directed upwards and posteriorly. In most instances, the confluence of the right and left hepatic duct lies anterior to the right hepatic artery. The portal vein is usually posterior to the bile duct and the hepatic artery at the hilum. With the right and left portal vein branches behind the respective arteries in the scan plane, the left portal vein and left hepatic artery are seen as elongated structures going down and to the left, running along towards the umbilical feature in the distance. And only the S4, as we are doing counterclockwise, we can come up to the liver hilum. And you can see behind the cystic duct, and this is the gallbladder. And you can start to see the vascular structures coming out into play here. 
And this is the anterior right portal vein with segment 5. And deeper is segment 8. Again, segment portal vein branch 5 and 8, and this is dividing up segment 5 and segment 8. And further rotation, you now begin to see the right posterior branches. It's the right posterior vein next to the right hepatic artery. And we start to see the, the, the dividing structures coming out now. This is the segment 6 and segment 7 branches of the portal vein. 4. So in conclusion, detailed EOS examination of the liver is possible. Possible blind spots would be the distant right posterior segment 7 and right anterior segment 8. A thorough understanding of the liver anatomy by curved linear EOS is essential for transhepatic EOS guided interventions. With that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Damien, for that uh, terrific talk and uh, for a very, very clear uh, explanation of um, liver anatomy as seen from the ultrasound endoscope. And that really sets the, 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 the tone for Dr. Ted Ken Chang's uh, talk later on. Um, I, I believe uh, Dr. Nontali is, is going to introduce our, our second speaker. Uh, over to you, Nontali. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, hi. Can, can you hear? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Kenneth Bin Moller. And um, uh, Ken is uh, very well recognized nationally and internationally as an authority and leader in advanced endoscopic procedures in the U.S. Has been performing complex interventional endoscopic procedures years ago, I would believe, like more than 20, 30 years ago, I think, has been publishing uh, over 200 um, papers. And uh, he's the director of the Interventional Endoscopy Service at California Pacific Medical Center um, in San Francisco. And it is my pleasure to invite Professor Ken Bin Moller to give us a talk on EUS guided vascular therapy. Hello, Ken. So Hello from San Francisco. I'm Ken Bin Muller and I'll be speaking on EUS guided vascular interventions. And my thanks to the organizing committee, especially Dr. Zabas, Suban and Gauri for their gracious invitation to participate. So EUS guided vascular intervention is really just an extension of what we're performing every day in our EUS uh, practice. We're using the same needle, an FNA needle, but instead of aspirating, we are doing the opposite we are injecting. So we're substituting the A for an I, and that I can stand for inject, and it can stand for uh, implant. So some of the things we can inject through the needle are sclerosins, sinoacrylate glue. We can implant a coil, and we can implant other substances such as gel foam, onyx, PVA, the list goes on. What is critical though is that we are able to visualize our target well and thankfully we have Doppler. So here you can see that the Doppler highlights the vessel thanks to the Doppler flow here and this allows us to target this vascular structure very precisely. Now you might wonder with FNA being around for some three decades why is it that we are only now starting to perform FNI for vascular therapy? Well, I think it has really to do with our fear of vessels. That's how we were trained, to avoid vessels. So now we're actually intentionally targeting the vessel 
as opposed to avoiding it. So it, it requires a change of mindset. Well, do we even need EUS? We are performing vascular interventions under endoscopic guidance, and we've been doing just fine. So why do we need EUS? Uh, what does it add to endoscopy? I will agree. If we're dealing with esophageal varices, these are located in the lamina propria. They are violations. We don't need EUS to visualize these varices. But it's very different for gastric varices. Gastric varices originate from the submucosa. So we may just be seeing the tip of the iceberg. In fact, it may look like a submucosal tumor on endoscopy or thickened gastric folds. So EUS does have a value there. And in fact, there have been studies in the past that have shown that the detection rate for gastric varices increases significantly when we use EUS to evaluate for a gastric varices. Similarly, for an ulcer, if we see a visible vessel, yes, of course, you don't need EUS, but the vessel may actually be below the surface. So again, just to emphasize, as endoscopists, we're only looking at the surface, and now with ultrasound, we can add that additional dimension of seeing below the surface. It's not just visualizing the vessel lumen, it's the feeder vessel that I think is a major advantage, that we can see that vessel and target that feeder vessel, and we can switch on the Doppler flow to confirm that our treatment was successful. But also, very importantly, EUS guidance allows us to dissociate ourselves from our dependency on endoscopic visualization. Here you can see a gastric varix, and it was punctured under endoscopic guidance. But as soon as we made our puncture, we get a gush of blood that completely reds out our view. And so in a situation like this, if you have EUS, you can now switch to the EUS image to guide your treatment. EUS allows us to target the feeder vessel. And this is nicely illustrated in this patient with a refractory Dillefois bleed. The patient had undergone virtually every endoscopic hemostatic modality under the sun, be it clips, uh, heater probe, thermal modalities, injection, even spraying sinoacrylate over the surface. As you know, a Dillefois lesion is a feeder arterial. And here on the ultrasound with Doppler, you can see the arterial penetrating through the gastric wall. So this video will show the targeting of this arterial. You'll see the needle here. We turn the Doppler off for a moment, but you can see that it's nicely placed within the lumen of the Dillefois arterial. And now we are dripping the cyanoacrylate glue into the lumen. And the glue is echogenic, so you can see it filling up the lumen. It creates also intense shadowing. So when we switch on the Doppler afterwards, we see no residual flow in the Dillefois lesion. And here, endoscopically, you can see that the bleeding has stopped and the patient did not have any recurrent bleeding afterwards. Another example of targeting the feeder vessel is shown in a patient with an esophageal varix bleed, had also undergone multiple band ligations for recurrent bleeding. Here you can see the varix, the residual varix. You can see the bleed here. So rather than just try bands yet again, we switch on the Doppler, we can see the perforating vessel leading to the varices that we see. And just as you saw with the Dillefaw, we are targeting the lumen of the perforating vessel and we are injecting the glue. Very echogenic and the Doppler was then negative afterwards and you can see some of the glue here exu extruding from the puncture site. This is a, I think, a very instructive 
study. It's a randomized controlled trial comparing endoscopic sclerotherapy and EUS guided sclerotherapy of esophageal collateral uh, veins. You can see these 50 patients were randomized and they had more than six month follow up. With EUS, the collateral vessel was uh, targeted. And in the EUS group, there were fewer and later recurrences. You can see that uh, here, the EUS group, compared to the control group, which underwent the standard endoscopic sclerotherapy treatment. And the authors found that it was the persistence of the collateral vessels that correlated with rebleeding. So it is this concept of targeting the feeder vessel that has been applied to, for the treatment of gastric varices. And Dr. Romero uh, Castro, Rafael from Seville and his group were the first to inject cyanoacrylate targeting the perforating feeder vessel in gastric varices. Now the goal here was to block the feeder to the gastric varices with lesser amounts of cyanoacrylate glue. And we'll discuss this in more detail in just a moment, but you can see that in these five patients, this was proof of concept using their standard regimen. They were able to achieve 100% hemostasis without any recurrent bleeding. So why this goal of a lesser amount of cyanoacrylate glue? Well, it's because of the dreaded complication of glue embolization or migration. It is a systemic migration. And for those of us who have been using the glue long enough, we have seen the glue embolize to virtually every organ of the body, be it the lungs, the spleen, the kidneys. If the patient has AV shunts or open foraminal valley to the brain, and it can migrate into the portal vein. You can see here the glue filling the portal vein like contrast uh, media. What about just avoiding cyanoacrylate glue altogether and just using coils? And this was similarly reported by the Seville Group in 2010. Proof of concept, case report, targeting the perforator vein, so the feeder vessel, with a eradication in three out of the four patients. But they required a mean of nine coils per patient, and in one patient, 22 coils. So feasible, but requiring a large number of coils. A multi-center trial then was conducted in Europe comparing EUS-guided coiling alone versus injection of cyanoacrylate. In the EUS uh, glue group, 19 patients, so these were actually two-thirds of the patients. They targeted the feeder and used a mean of 1.5 milliliters per patient. In the EUS coil group, 11 patients, so the remaining a third or so, targeting the feeder and used a mean of six coils uh, per a patient. Now what they found, and this I think is striking, there was evidence of lung emboli in nearly 50% of the patients, half of the patients, on CT scans that were obtained after the procedure. Whereas if they used uh, coils, uh, they did not see any lung emboli. Now, is it just the coils though? What's interesting is that 18% of the patients who had coils to start still needed glue. And even in these patients who had additional glue injection, no lung embolization was uh, seen. So this raises the question, can we avoid systemic migration embolization by placing a coil before injecting the glue? The coil would Muted. fill and reduce the flow in the varics, so it would reduce the probability Unmuted. of the glue flowing away into the systemic bloodstream but more importantly, the coil with its woolly strands serves as a scaffold to retain the glue at the injection site. So here you can see such a typical coil extruded from an FNA needle. And this is a ex vivo proof of concept. You can see that in this jar of heparinized blood, we first uh, placed a coil, then we injected glue, and you can see that the glue is adherent to the coil, and there was no residual glue seen in the uh, container, raising at least the possibility 
that all of the glue can be retained at the site of injection. This here is a, a video showing a very large gastric varix. It's in the fundus and with EUS, Doppler confirms the blood flow and we are puncturing uh, the varix with a 19 gauge needle and we are deploying a 20 millimeter coil, that's the largest coil that we have available, into the varix. You can see the coil coiling up inside of the varix lumen and we follow that immediately with an injection of cyanoalkylate. I'm currently actually placing uh, at least two coils before the cyanoacrylate for such large varices. And here at nine month follow-up, you can see that the gastric varices are obliterated comparing before and uh, after. We publish our results in a large cohort of uh, patients, uh, 152 patients over a six year period. We had high technical success rates. Our rebleeding rate was 16%, whereby only half of these patients had bleeding from gastric varices, so 8%. Adverse events in 7%. One patient developed a pulmonary embolus, but this was one week after the glue injection procedure, and the patient had been discharged home and was completely asymptomatic. So we are finally starting to see some well-designed uh, trials investigating the value of an EUS-guided hybrid approach using coil and glue. Now, this is still a small study, but I think it adds a significant insight here. And it's uh, from Brazil. And it is a pilot randomized controlled trial. Patients randomized to EUS-guided coil and glue versus conventional treatment using only glue. These 32 patients were equally divided in the two groups. Thrombosis rates were about the same, but the rate of pulmonary embolus was half in those patients undergoing the coil and glue compared to only glue. This did not reach statistical significance, but I think this could very well be a type two error. Now this is a meta-analysis in general, uh, as a rule, I don't like meta-analyses, but in this case, we have a large N, so I'm going to mention this. And this is comparing EUS-guided versus conventional glue injection. And we have 23 studies using all EUS modalities. So it's not just glue, it's maybe a hybrid approach as well, or just with coil. 851 patients versus endoscopy-guided 28 studies almost 3,500 patients. And this found a statistically uh, significant superiority of the EUS guided approach in terms of recurrence of gastric varices. So 9.1% versus 18%. This meta-analysis also then broke down the patients receiving EUS guidance to glue alone versus coil alone versus glue and coil, so hybrid. And these are 23 studies, 851 patients. And here also, they found that the recurrence rate of the gastric varices was significantly uh, lower when using a EUS coil and glue approach compared to using only EUS guided glue. So this suggests that the hybrid approach is uh, superior. The late rebleeding rate was also significantly lower in patients receiving the hybrid approach compared to glue alone. The mortality rate, the all cause, was significantly lower in using the hybrid approach compared to EUS guided glue alone. This study randomized patients to EUS guided coil and glue, the hybrid approach, versus just coils alone. So this is from Ecuador. And here you can see when they used only coils, the cumulative incidence of reintervention was significantly higher compared to when they used the uh, hybrid approach. The rebleeding rate was significantly lower with the hybrid approach. The varix reappearance rate significantly lower. The reintervention free time significantly lower, and as mentioned, the reintervention rate also lower. 
So I'd like to spend the last uh, few minutes touching on EUS-guided portal angiotherapy. The advantage of EUS over percutaneous access is that we have direct access to the portal vein. Radiologists do not have that direct access. And these are two applications that right now are under investigation. The first being portal injection chemotherapy. It's, the acronym is EPIC. And the second would be creation of an a EUS-guided portal systemic shunt, or TIPS. So these are uh, data uh, that are currently only available uh, in the animal model. The goal is to optimize the liver level of chemotherapy and minimize systemic levels, i.e. the toxicity. The authors evaluated paclitaxel, doxyrubicin, and irinotecan. And what they found was that by injecting directly EUS-guided into the portal vein, they could increase the hepatic levels 1.6-fold and decrease the systemic levels 1.3-fold. Irinotecan, 1.7-fold increase and a 50% decrease in systemic levels. Doxorubicin was really impressive, an increase of the hepatic levels 5-fold with a systemic decrease of 474-fold and 31-fold for cardiac levels, which obviously is important for doxorubicin due to the uh, cardiac toxicity. I'll just mention the EOS-guided portal systemic sh uh, shunt, which has some conceptual advantages. We can directly access the liver vessels from the stomach, as you can uh, see here, same way that we're using this now to perform EOS-guided uh, ERCP. This is ultrasound-guided versus fluoroscopy-guided, and we can combine this, of course, with other endoscopic treatments such as glue injection or coil and glue. In earlier studies, used a tubular metal stent to create the tips. Now we're using lumen-opposing uh, metal stents. And here is some uh, work that I did. You can see the needle traversing the IVC and entering into the portal vein here. Then we deploy the distal flange of the lambs in the portal vein and the proximal flange here in the IVC. And this is now our tips. And you can see here the IVC and the portal vein with the lambs connecting the vascular uh, lumens. So what does the future hold? This is all still investigational. Epic portal injection chemotherapy very exciting and very promising. EOS guided portal systemic shunt still in its infancy, only animal studies so far. Infusion portal vein thrombolysis. This actually has been reported in uh, patients. Uh, so we look forward to more on this and coil embolization for liver lobe hypertrophy. This also uh, has been reported uh, in patients. So again, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to contribute. Hi, thank you very much, Ken, for such a wonderful talk. It's always been a pleasure to uh, hear you giving a talk. It's always inspirational. Yep. So, um, uh, Chris, there are some questions, but I'm not sure how you want to do this. Do you want all the presenters to give their talks and then we'll, we'll keep Q&A at the end for all the speakers? Yes. Okay. That's right. That, that is the plan. So okay. we, we'll, go, we'll move ahead with the, uh, the talk number three first. And uh, uh, I would remind all the, um, everyone who has a question, please submit your question in the, the, the chat box. And we're all busy compiling them so that we can get them together for the, each of the faculty to, to answer in turn. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Ken, great talk. And, and, um, and uh, we'll keep you for questions soon. Uh, but it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Professor Kenneth J. Chang, who is the um, Chief of Division of Gastro. Uh, hi, Ken. Uh, at uh, University of California, Irvine. He's also the executive director of uh, the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, in, in that same institution. And um, 
I, I don't, almost don't know where to begin actually introducing uh, Professor Chang when it comes to uh, EUS because he really has been one of the pioneers from the beginning. Um, many of us have grown up uh, learning EUS with the video uh, or CD that he produced together with Dr. Rick Erickson um, way, way back. And I mean, this was 20 years ago, and it, I think it's still a staple. The illustrations are excellent, the anatomy. It, it really is a great first step, but, uh, but I, I think I'm talking too much, and I really want to um, hand over to, to Ken uh, to, to talk about um, endohepatology. This is a... a, a um, uh, a term which he has very appropriately coined, and 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 this is so appropriate for this meeting because um, it uh, what what Ken is going to tell us really uh, encompasses really the whole spectrum of uh, utility of EUS in hepatology, and this I think will take the field of hepatology perhaps to the next level. So uh, over to you, Ken. Greetings from California. I'd like to thank Chris Kaur, Adil, Professor Abbas for inviting me to this prestigious PSSLD 2020. The title of my lecture is Endohepatology, A New Paradigm. These are my disclosures. The concept of endohepatology is a rather new paradigm and I published on this in 2012 realizing that endoscopy and liver disease were quite separate. And I saw opportunities where endoscopy and hepatology can really converge into this concept of endohepatology, and I'll explain more. Specifically in the area of fatty liver disease, we're undergoing an epidemic or pandemic, uh, different than COVID, but a pandemic of obesity, and fatty liver in, in the United States and throughout the world. Here we're seeing some data from the United States where if you look at patients uh, who have NAFLD, uh, about one out of every three adults have fat accumulation in the liver. Uh, we call that NAFLD. From there, 12 to 40% of those patients can go on to have NASH non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is about 5 to 10 percent of our adult population can have NASH, and NASH, as you know, can lead to cirrhosis, and from cirrhosis to hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as the need for liver transplant or dying from liver disease. And NASH is projected to overtake hepatitis C as the leading cause of liver transplants in the United States. And in my view, there are two areas of unmet need in the whole fatty liver spectrum. The first unmet need is right here. While we have non-invasive tests that may uh, suggest that the patient has NASH, the only really way to diagnose NASH is with a liver biopsy. And I think we have great opportunities in terms of EUS kind of liver biopsy uh, which may be more uh, comfortable for the patient and more uh, readily available. The other unmet need is here. Once the patient has established NASH, uh, we don't really have a good way of monitoring their progression towards irreversible cirrhosis. And here's where EUS guided portal pressure gradient measurement uh, can have a very important role. Uh, so two areas of uh, unmet need that we'll be talking about. So first, EOS guided liver biopsy. Uh, this is something that has been uh, fairly well established and developed. And uh, this is the technique that uh, I have for EOS liver biopsy, just using a standard 19 gauge uh, FNA needle. Uh, we advance the needle into the liver, and then once in position, uh, we apply high suction with heparinized saline and we advance the needle very, very quickly to get maximal capture of liver tissue. And then we bring the needle back. Moving on from routine uh, standard needles to now specialized uh, tip core needles. So this is an example of a single pass, single actuation uh, using a um, 19 gauge 
transient tip needle, which can give, here we're seeing, this is a, about an eight centimeter long, uh, single pass, single actuation biopsy, uh, showing just tremendous uh, intact architecture and uh, abundant amount of complete portal tracts. Uh, so I think uh, the E-West Sky liver biopsy will continue to improve and uh, given its safety and, and patient comfort, I think we'll be able to uh, address a lot of the unmet need in terms of establishing a firm diagnosis of NASH. What about this unmet need from NASH progression to cirrhosis? And this is in the area of EUS guided portal systemic pressure gradient. So we know that portal hypertension is a serious complication of liver cirrhosis. And the, the hepatic venous pressure gradient, HVPG, accurately reflects the, the degree of portal hypertension and is the single best prognostic factor in liver disease. And it helps to guide medical therapy and it predicts liver decompensation as well as liver cancer risk. So what is the portal pressure gradient? Uh, simply, it's the pressure difference between the portal vein here and the hepatic vein here. So the gradient is the pressure of the portal vein minus the pressure in the hepatic vein. And there are three uh, hepatic veins, the right, the middle, and the left hepatic vein, which go into the inferior vena cava. Uh, and we typically measure the pressure in one of the three branches of the hepatic vein, as well as measuring the portal vein, and that is our gradient. And normal pressure is less than or equal to 5 millimeters of mercury. Greater than 5 uh, is the definition of portal hypertension. Greater than 10 signifies clinically significant portal hypertension. And greater than 12, 12 millimeters of mercury uh, means that the patient is at high risk for bleeding from esophageal or gastric varices. Currently, uh, the pressure gradient is measured through transjugular HBPG. The procedure is done by interventional radiology where there's initially an incision in the neck and a catheter needle goes into the internal jugular vein and is advanced through the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and then into usually the right hepatic vein. Once in the right hepatic vein, then the pressure is recorded three times and that's called the free hepatic vein pressure. And after obtaining the free hepatic vein pressure, a balloon is inflated and the catheter is wedged. And the wedged hepatic venous pressure indirectly correlates with the portal vein pressure. And that correlation is fairly precise if the sinusoids are stiff, if the sinusoids are uh, more uh, compliant or normal, then that uh, correlation is uh, less uh, tight. Uh, so it, it is an indirect uh, measurement of the portal vein pressure. So we uh, began working about eight, nine years ago on uh, developing the ability for EOS to actually obtain direct portal pressure gradient measurements through a needle and a transducer. So this is the uh, uh, compact manometer. Uh, it's made by Cook Medical. And it's a, trans it's a manometer that uh, attaches to a uh, non-compressible tubing. The tubing is then connected to the handle of a needle. In this case, it's a 25 gauge needle. We also attach a heparinized syringe uh, so we can flush the manometer and tubing uh, and needle, so everything is primed with uh, saline or heparinized saline. So we reported this uh, animal study, series of animals that we did and published in GIE of 2016, where we looked at uh, both simultaneous EUS guided portal pressure gradient measurement with transjugular balloon catheter measurement. And here you can see in panel A, uh, we have the, the catheter, transjugular catheter in the right hepatic vein, and at the same time we have an EOS 25 gauge needle in the same vessel, and we can obtain pressures simultaneously. 
Uh, here we see the EOS image of the needle in the right hand back vein along with the catheter. And here we can see the needle uh, placed in, directly in the left portal vein, uh, which cannot be done by a uh, transjugular approach, but we can access the portal vein directly uh, with the EOS needle. And our studies from the animal uh, experiments showed that we had a very tight correlation. In the y-axis, uh, we have the transjugular pressure. In the x-axis, uh, we have the 25 gauge uh, needle pressure. And we can see the correlation between the two pressure measurements is very tight, uh, r equals 0 0.985. So we were able to show and confirm that these two pressure measurements were fairly uh, identical. Then we went on to the human pilot study where we looked at the feasibility and safety of performing EOS PPG in humans. And we wanted to correlate the EOS PPG value with the endoscopic and clinical evidence of portal hypertension in patients with liver disease. And we published this in GIE in 2017. The results in all 28 subjects who underwent EOS PPG, we had 100% technical success. Uh, we were able to identify and access and target all the vessels, and we were able to obtain meaningful metric pressures. There were no complications, and the range of EOS PPG was from 1.5, which is normal, to as high as 19 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this diagram shows the method. Uh, first, we would approach the hepatic vein. Usually, it's the middle hepatic vein. The needle would go through the gastric wall, through liver parenchyma, and enter into the hepatic vein. Once in the vein, we would measure three times the pressure. Then we would move the, and, and uh, advance the needle into the portal vein, and it's usually the left portal vein, and again, the needle goes through liver into the vessel, measure three times, an average of three measurements, and then we would subtract the difference between the hepatic vein and the portal vein. Uh, next is a video showing some of the portal vein anatomy. And here the needle is going through the uh, liver, and that's confirmed, and then the needle is going through liver and then we can advance the needle directly into the middle hepatic vein seen here. Once the needle is, in, is inserted, then we start measuring the pressure. Uh, we flush the needle and then the pressure settles and here it settles at 13 millimeters of mercury. We do a second measurement and it's going to settle also at 13 and then the third measurement at 13 millimeters of mercury, so very precise. And then when we remove the needle, we're doing it under Doppler control and make sure there's no flow in the needle track before removing the needle. Uh, then next we focus on the left uh, portal vein. The needle is again going through liver parenchyma and advanced into the umbilical portion of the left portal vein. And here we're again flushing the needle and measuring the pressure. And here the pressure is 15 the second pressure is 14, the third pressure is 14, uh, so very precise, and now the needle comes back into the liver, and once we see no Doppler in the needle tract, we can safely remove the needle, and the pressure gradient was normal, 1.3 millimeters of mercury. So our study conclusions is that this human pilot study showed that this novel technique using EOS PPG and a 25 gauge needle and a compact manometer was feasible and appeared safe, and these values uh, show excellent correlation with the clinical parameters of portal hypertension. So I just want to finish with showing you another uh, example of how useful this uh, endohepatology is in taking care of patients with fatty liver disease. This is a 55-year-old female with history of lupus who has obesity with a BMI of 33. Uh, she had chronically elevated liver tests ALT 97, AST 114, platelet count of 198. And the question was, does this patient have NAFLD? Does this patient have NASH? But the, her, her ANA was positive at 1 to 160. So does the patient have autoimmune hepatitis? Or does she have fatty liver disease? And the fiber scan showed only F1, F2 disease. So we went ahead and performed endohepatology.
We also are now measuring the portal pressure, and here we're in the middle height of and the pressure is 17, 18, and 18. Uh, so then we uh, look at the portal vein pressure, and the needle is advanced into the portal vein, and here you can see uh, the needle directly in the portal vein, and uh, the measurement uh, of the pressure is high, 23, 24, and 24. So it's not normal? So the gradient is actually 6.0 millimeters of mercury. So the patient does have early portal hypertension. Now we want to do the liver biopsy, which is using the uh, Francine tip needle, AQ19, single pass, uh, single actuation. And, uh, and here we have the uh, biopsy results. So the patient has severe steatosis. 70% uh, steatosis, which is quite high. The patient has prominent steatohepatitis and already has advanced stage steatofibrosis or cirrhosis. Uh, the liver biopsy with a single pass, single actuation resulted in 25 complete portal tracts and there was no morphology of overlapping autoimmune disease. So we were able to give conclusive diagnosis that this is all related to NASH and not on immune hepatitis. So this was done in 2019, and the patient was told that she needed to lose weight, which was very difficult. Uh, so then I went ahead and did an endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, and the patient was able to lose 60 pounds. And then we got the patient back in about 12 months after her initial examination, and we repeated the liver biopsy and the USPPG after she lost 60 pounds. Her repeat US portal pressure gradient was normal, it was zero. And that was amazing to see the dramatic uh, intervention and response to her weight loss. And uh, as important, we looked at, the, at her liver biopsy. So in 2019, you remember, she had significant steatosis and inflammatory response to the fat. A year later, after she lost 60 pounds with the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, uh, we find almost no fat and very little to minimal inflammation. So we completely reversed the fuel for the fire uh, in her disease. And this really underscores how powerful endohepatology is in patients with fatty liver disease. I'd like to finish with a final example. Here is a scenario where the current HVPG as an indirect measurement may not accurately reflect the true portal vein pressure. A 64-year-old female with type 2 diabetes, BMI of 26, myelodysplastic syndrome, MGUS, has renal cell carcinoma and awaiting nephrectomy. However, she's noted to have esophageal varices and had banding times two, was sent to interventional radiology for HVPG. The IVC pressure was six, the right hepatic vein pressure was six, and the wedge hepatic vein pressure was 12, giving an HVPG gradient of 6. This didn't quite make sense with the presence of varices, and so there was a suspicion for presinusoidal prehepatic portal hypertension, and she was referred for EUS-guided PPG. On EUS, the liver parenchyma was fairly normal. There. There's my needle. Let's see. Yep. Hit it. Bring it back, bring it back, bring it back, bring 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 back, Ready to flush. 19. Okay, 19. So 20, 20, 19. Yeah. Well, it's not six. US PPG therefore was 12 millimeters of mercury, consistent with portal hypertension. Two months later, at the time of nephrectomy, a wedge liver biopsy was performed on the left lobe, which showed mild periportal fibrosis with rare bridging and minimal interstitial chronic inflammation with no steatosis.
So the final clinical diagnosis was idiopathic non serotic portal hypertension and was treated with a splenectomy at the time of the nephrectomy. So in summary, we now have with endohepatology the ability to give our patients with liver disease a one-stop shop endoscopic liver evaluation. So endoscopically, we can evaluate for gastric varices and portal hypertensive gastropathy. We can evaluate for esophageal varices. Uh, with EUS, we can now do shear wave elastography in and, and both right and left lobes of the liver. We can perform EUS guided portal pressure gradient measurement, and we can perform EUS guided liver biopsy, and all of this can be done in one procedure. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Ken. That was a terrific uh, talk and uh, tour de force. Um, uh, and and uh, and and uh, please please don't go away because I'm, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions for you a little bit later. Um, it, it's again my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce the next speaker, my co-chair, whom I neglected to introduce uh, earlier on uh, properly. Uh, but uh, Dr. Natalie Pasawasti is uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at uh, uh, Sri Raj Hospital in Mahidol University in, in, in uh, Bangkok. And that, that's the, the King's Hospital for those of you who, who know uh, Thailand and Bangkok a little bit better. Uh, but not, Natalie um, uh, did her GI fellowship at Ann, uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And she stayed on, in, on on staff for several years before returning to her native Thailand, um, where she is really very active on the um, academic and educational scene. Uh, she has served as the uh, general secretary for the Gastro Association of Thailand, and she's currently the uh, vice president of the Thai Association of GI Endoscopy as well. Uh, so Nontali is going to talk to us about liver biopsy, U.S. guided liver biopsy, and I'll, I'll uh, hand the uh, the mic over to her now. Over to you, Nontali. Thanks, Chris, for that introduction, and I'd like to say hello to everyone in the symposium. Hi, Ken, and uh, I think I have the pre-recording yeah. as well, so I like to play that. Yes, we will play. Yep. Okay. I'd like to thank the PSSLD Organizing Committee for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. My talk is on EUS guided liver biopsy. I will cover the overview of liver biopsy, the literature on the diagnostic performance of EUS guided liver biopsy, the comparison between different liver biopsy methods, and finally we'll touch on the techniques and complications. Liver biopsy is the gold standard for making the diagnosis of many liver diseases. Through the percutaneous and transjugular methods, the diagnostic yield is over 95% with complication rate of less than 10%. With percutaneous method, post-procedural pain is up to 35%. In cases of coagulopathy or presence of ascites, transjugular approach can be an alternative. U.S. guided liver biopsy has been emerging as it has overcome many limitations of the percutaneous approach. U.S. causes less pain, provides real-time ultrasound and Doppler, avoiding intervening vessels. It provides by lobar biopsy in the same session and can be done in obese patients. The main question is, can EUS provide enough tissue adequacy? A pool analysis show that EUS provides adequate specimen length and number of complete portal tracts based on ESOL and ASLD criteria. I would like to show you on this slide the studies assessing the performance of EUS FNA guided liver biopsy in patients with chronic liver diseases. 
Most studies are retrospective, assessing the 19 gauge aspiration needles. US FNA has 100% technical success and more than 90% diagnostic yield, with 3 to 4 centimeter specimen length and 8 to 14 complete portal tracks with almost no complications. This slide shows the performance of EUS FNB, guided liver biopsy in patients with chronic liver diseases, using both 19 and 22 gauge needles. Again, technical success is 100%, and EUS FNB provides an excellent diagnostic yield. The specimen length and complete uh, portal tract are varies, but definitely adequate. Overall complications were less than 10%. More studies are shown here on this slide, and the results are consistent across the study. And again, the size of the needle that were used was um, 19 and 22, given 100% technical success. Furthermore, the utility of EUS guided liver biopsy has been assessed in non-alcoholic fatty liver population. Most of the studies show excellent technical success approaching 100% and diagnostic yield. The specimen length ranges from 11 to 71 millimeters and the number of complete portal tracks ranges from 9 to 33 suggesting the usefulness of EUS-guided liver biopsy in NASH. In terms of focal liver lesions, both EUS, FNB, and FNA have been assessed with 22, 25, and 20 gauge needles. EUS-guided liver biopsy provides more than 90% diagnostic yield However, one death, one bleeding, two post-procedural fever, and two post-procedural abdominal pain have been reported. Based on the recently published meta-analysis of EUS-guided Prinkamol liver biopsy, the pool analysis show that the total specimen length was 4.5 centimeters and complete portal tract of 15. However, this study was limited by the retrospective nature of the recruited studies and heterogeneity. However, when looking at the aspiration needles, the specimen length is similar to the um, biopsy needle. Nonetheless, the biopsy needle provides more complete portal tract compared to the aspiration needle. Therefore, the data suggests that F and B needles may be more favorable for liver parenchymal biopsy. When we compare the EUS guided liver biopsy to percutaneous and transjugular, percutaneous approach seems to be better in terms of complete portal triad and the length of the longest core. However, EUS approach provides longer total specimen length with less complication, but more tissue fragmentation, which is a crucial disadvantage of EUS guided biopsy. A systematic review and meta-analysis comparing the three modalities show comparable cumulative adequacy ranging from 93% by EUS 97% by transjugular and 98% um, by percutaneous. When compare EUS approach to percutaneous, it seems that the percutaneous approach provides comparable complete portal triads with um, p-value of more than 0.05 and length of the longest piece. However, EUS offers longer total specimen length. As for the transjugular approach, it has comparable length of the longest piece to EUS, but provides more complete 
portal tracked. Nonetheless, EUS offers longer total specimen length. The authors concluded that EUS is safe and comparable to the other two methods in terms of biopsy specimen and adverse event. In terms of techniques, many studies have been conducted to improve the quality of EUS guided biopsy. People have looked at the number of to and fro movement, number of passes, needle types, and suction. One study suggests that single actuation and single pass might be enough. We are waiting for more studies on that. As for the needles, many studies have compared different sizes and different needle designs. 19 FNA versus FNB, 22 gauge acquire versus 19 true cut, 19 gauge core versus acquire, and comparison between six different types of needles. It seems though that by far the 19 gauge Francine needle design has the most favorable data. Wet suction with heparin also has been shown to improve the diagnostic yield compared to dry suction. Finally, I think that the techniques still need to be fine-tuned. Whether or not we should have liver biopsy-specific method remains to be seen. In order to find um, the best needle, our Thai group conducted a study called SAFE study, which is a prospective randomized trial comparing 20 gauge forward bevel, which is the third generation of the uh, new needle, and 22 reverse bevel. The study was done on patients presenting with liver mass. The results of the study show that 20 gauge needle provides longer length of tissue. However, there were no differences in terms of tissue adequacy, diagnostic yield, and blood contamination, as well as um, complications. And um, the majority of our cases had um, hepatocellular carcinoma. Here is the um, appearance of the core tissue comparing between 20 gauge and 22 gauge. Here is an example of a case recruited in the study. This is a, a 56-year-old male who presented with abdominal pain and CT scan show a liver mass um, at segment four. Here, um, uh, the biopsy needle was used to um, obtain the uh, tissue from the liver mass, and we use conventional techniques. As far as um, complications, EUS liver biopsy has about 10% overall complication rate. Post-procedural pain is the most common complication, ranging from 8 to 21%. Bleeding occurs in about 1%. Major complications, including death, bile leak, and major bleeding have been reported. In conclusion, EUS is safe and effective, but standardization of the techniques is still needed. The use of EUS guided liver biopsy is still limited due to the sedation requirement and the cost. It can be, however, an alternative method in morbid obesity, ascites, lack of cooperation, and patients undergoing endoscopy for other reasons. It provides by lower biopsy in cases of non-uniform liver diseases and improves the assessment of disease activity and fibrosis in NASH. Therefore, the future of EUS got a liver biopsy is very promising and many studies are underway. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention now and I will be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Terrific talk, uh, as usual. Um, we, we, we're now going to take questions, and, and there's been a kind of a steady stream of questions uh, coming to us. And uh, we'll wait for, is, is uh, Dr. Ken Binmuller um, still around as well? Uh, 
Yes. Uh, oh, great. I'm here. Terrific, Ken. Uh, terrific. And uh, okay, and, and Damien as well. So actually, the first question that we saw on the list was is actually for, for Damien uh, earlier on. And the question was that, uh, or a statement first, and that he, uh, the, 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 the person asking the questions uh, made the comment that uh, positioning of the scope in the US scope in the funders is often difficult. Um, you know, and, and uh, do you have a problem with, uh, with that when you are doing the US evaluation of, of the liver? Uh, and if so, how, how do you uh, get around that? I think the US uh, from the stomach, uh, it's actually uh, not too difficult because you can actually adjust uh, accordingly. The stomach is actually quite mobile and you just have to follow the segments according to how the vascular anatomy divides up the liver. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be uh, too difficult, of course. Uh, certain times there's variations and it may be difficult to assess, but I think for purposes of identifying the segments, it's, it's, it's quite standard. Uh, maybe it's just smaller lesions, maybe sometimes further away from the probe and uh, deeper in, those are the harder ones to assess. Damien, um, my question is that, you know, generally I would always use linear echoendoscope to assess the liver. Well, have you had experience using radio? Uh, or there have been, been, uh, been uh, papers publishing uh, on that, uh, but personally, I, I, I prefer the linear scope because I mean, when you're doing US of the liver, there's already a plan for some form of intervention. I mean, uh, you want to either target a liver mass, which is the most common indication, or you want to target uh, the vessels for portal vein interventions. So I, I don't really see the need uh, for a radioscope uh, at this point of time uh, because your goal is to target something. Yeah, I would agree. What, 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 what about Ken? Uh, both Ken Bin Moller and Ken Chang, have you uh, seen? Have you seen any benefits of using radio echo endoscopes these days, at all? Not just the liver. I mean, in general. I still use it. That's how I trained. Um, so I still use it for you know tubular staging of um, cancers, esophagus, rectal. Um, sometimes I'll use it also to evaluate sets of uh, epithelial lesions in the uh, stomach. It is nice because it gives you uh, sort of a tomographic perspective. So I think um, I think it, there's still some utility, but it's really used overall because usually we're we want to combine it with. FNA. Yeah, I, um, Ken and I are both old school. So, uh, I, uh, ruminal staging, of course, rectal esophageal cancer, uh, lumps and bumps in the stomach, uh, radio is really nice. And, and the new thing that I'm using it uh, a lot on is actually during the POEM procedure. I like to use EUS before POEM uh, to assess. Mm -hmm. uh, We've got about a one to two percent rate of pseudo achalasia, which is devastating if you miss it. So you don't want to create a, a tunnel to find out if there's a cancer. So uh, that's helpful. And then it really gr gives a great roadmap, uh, looking how thick the muscle is before you start, looking for vasculature and you know the best route to tunnel. Um, and it's the radial is also really good in, in GERD evaluation. We can evaluate the cura, uh, the integrity of the cura, and so on. So there's still yet some old school utility for the radial. Okay. Yeah, it, it's very good to hear that because here in this part of the world, um, many countries in Asia are moving away from using the radio. Part of it is that, you know, the questions that I have always got is that if they have limited budget and if they can only buy one type of scope, what would they, you know, go for? Which is an obvious that they would need to go for a linear. But here in this forum, we're still um, saying that the radio has its role and it, it can add some benefits as well. Yeah. I think for the liver, the linear is, is really the go-to uh, because the anatomy and the vasculature, as Damien so beautifully uh, showed us, you know, the hepatic veins all uh, uh, come in uh, radially straight to, towards the IVC, 
and your linear scope can pick up uh, all of that, uh, um, um, you know, uh, trajectory of those vessels coming directly back into the IVC, whereas you wouldn't get the same uh, with the radial, especially when we're then targeting, you know, with the vessels now. And also the shear wave elastography on the linear is phenomenal, and that's a, a, a new added modality to endohepatology doing shear wave elastography. So, and we uh, we have a few more questions. I think this next one is going to Ken Bin Moller. So, what is the amount of glue being used per one injection, and um, is it vary in size? If yes, then what is the optimal dosage? That's a great question. Could I? Yeah, of course. Could I, I just add to that because I, I realized that uh, in the U.S. Um, the the preparation used is dermabond, uh, and and in the rest of the world uh, it's it's histoacryl, and we often um, dilute that with with uh, uh, you know lipiodol uh, to to make it polymerize less quickly. Um, would you please comment on, on, on that also and, and, and you know how likely we are to glue up the needle and, and perhaps the scope as well? So it's sort of serendipity. When I returned to the US from Hamburg, Germany, where I was using the histoacryl, so that's the n butyl 2 cyanoacrylate uh, with Nipsander, and he pioneered, of course, the technique uh, the problem with the histoacryl is that it polymerizes uh, very rapidly. Uh, so it's actually mixed with the lipidol, not so much due to it being the contrast agent, although certainly if you wanted to look for embolization, it's useful there, right? Because it, it's, it's used by the radiologist as a contrast agent. But it was really used because it delays the polymerization of the glue. Um, when I came to the States, there was no histoacryl. It was not FDA cleared for any indication. Um, and the only glue that was available was Dermavon. And it was being used in the emergency room as a skin adhesive. So I had to be creative. It was at least FDA cleared. It wasn't actually you know, approved or cleared for variceal bleeding. Uh, and certainly not for endoscopic guided delivery, but at least I had something that wasn't illegal. <laughs> and so I started using the Dermabond actually because it was the only option that I had. But I soon discovered there were advantages to using the Dermabond. And the first advantage is I didn't have to mix it with the lipidol. And the lipidol is very viscous, as you know. And so it's harder to inject, whereas the the glue itself, the cyanoacrylate, it's like water. So it injects very easily. So I found it very easy to inject the Dermabond, not having to dilute it or mix it with lipidol. So the polymerization is about three to four uh, times longer than the glue, the histocryl, I should say. So um, that gives you uh, more time and certainly the staff is less stressed out knowing that the glue is not going to plug up your catheter while you're injecting. And even worse, it could the, the, the needle could actually get stuck, and that's happened from time to time. It, it could get stuck in the varix. So, and then finally, because you're injecting with such hard force and pressure to get it all in fast, there's a possibility that even though you're lure locked under the hub of your catheter, if it slips or cracks, it could spray. So everyone has to wear the shielding, the eyewear, the guards, and so forth. So these are all reasons why suddenly the glue injection became much less stressful. So these are some practical advantages, but in the end, they proved to be very, I think, very uh, important in terms of my later favoring the use of the Dermabond over the histoacryl after histoacryl became available in the United States. So we have that now, the n butyl 2 cyanoacrylate, but I have chosen to stay with the Dermabond because of the longer polymerization time. Now there are, there's one other advantage though, and I believe that 
actually dripping the glue into the varix, literally drop by drop, reduces your risk of embolization. Now, it doesn't eliminate that risk because if you have vigorous flow in the varix, and often you do have quite vigorous flow through these gastric varices, especially if you have a gastrorenal shunt. So the flow can be very uh, significant. Um, but if you just drip it in, I think you have less of a risk of it flowing away. And if you place a coil first, then the coil will capture, will act like a net to retain the glue in place as you're injecting it. But again, it's important to inject it slowly because if you inject it fast, then you're gonna get a stream and then it'll flow away. So these are all efforts really to reduce the risk of embolization. That's the nemesis of using glue, is that the glue can go anywhere in the body and it can be fatal uh, in some locations. So um, long story short, Dermabond was the only thing I had available to me uh, in the beginning, but I've stuck with it now because uh, it's, at least in my practice, it has, a, has had a great record. Ken, would, would you sort of uh, speak to also to how to protect, you know, the, the scope uh, channel and the transducer from uh, some really very expensive uh, repairs? Yeah, so this question always comes up and it's a great one and an important one. And we have destroyed some scopes back in the day when we were injecting endoscopy guided. So there you have to be really careful that after you inject the glue, typically when you pull your needle out, glue starts extruding from the puncture site and it can literally just fall right on the tip of your endoscope and instantaneously destroy your scope. And if you suction the glue before it's completely solidified, it'll solidify in your working channel and then you really have destroyed the scope permanently. Otherwise, it might just be on the outside. It may not look nice, but at least it's still usable. But if it's in the working channel, it's gone. You can throw that thing away. So what the, this is, I think, an advantage of doing it e guided. So you have a balloon over the transducer. So actually that balloon is protecting the tip of your scope. But since you're going transesophageal, so you're not going transgastric the way you do it in retroflexion, you do this with your scope, scope orthograde. It's forward view. You're going through the distal esophagus. So now you're going through the esophageal wall from the back into the varix. And when you pull your needle out, the glue doesn't extrude through your puncture site. You might get a little bit of back bleeding, very minimal. Even patients with varices, esophageal varices, I have found have minimal bleeding. But you're not going to see any glue extrude out. But even if some glue were to extrude out, you have the balloon that's protecting the tip of your scope. So what I do is after I use an FNA needle, of course, so after I pull the needle back out of the varix, transesophageal. I actually extend the sheet a little bit, and then I just pull the whole scope out. I don't pull the FNA needle out of the working channel. And then the assistant will clean off the sheet, the tip, and after that's cleaned off, then pull that out of the working channel. So that at least gives you that added assurance that you're not going to get any glue in the working channel. But the good thing about the longer polymerization time is also you have some more time, if any glue got under scope, to wash it off. Uh, Ken, please allow me to interject. So my name is Nadeem Tahami. I'm uh, based in Southampton, UK. Uh, so we've traditionally been using thrombin uh, instead of cyanoacrylate uh, for the risks that you've just mentioned. Um, uh, in terms of EOS guided therapy, again, our go-to is thrombin with uh, coils. Uh, we have used cyanoacrylate with glue as well, but it's the preference from unit point of view is to uh, use thrombin rather than cy cyanoacrylate. Uh, the difficulty that we have found is, is in those who have kind of isol isolated gastric wax, um, quite high up in the fundus. Uh, those are the cases where it could become a bit uh, tricky. I don't know if you've got any uh, tricks up your sleeve that you may wish to share with us. And if I could may just go back to the earlier question raised about radial versus linear. So although we have uh, access to both, but uh, again, go to is linear, especially when it comes down to endohepatology. And I think it, 
gives you a bit more focused views and it's uh, in terms of your de decision making is more precise than with the with the radial scopes so i would be keen to hear what your point of view is yeah you have uh, several questions there or you know uh, i think both kens can comment uh, i'll just firstly comment just on the throbin uh, actually in hamburg uh, we did uh, do a trial early on many years ago decades ago um, and we found that the problem with the thrombin is that it recanalizes, the varics recanalizes, and of course, you know, it's biologic. So unlike the cyanoacrylate, which is like cement, and so you permanently plugged up that lumen, and it's an adhesive. You see, it sticks to the wall of the varics. The thrombin doesn't stick. It's, you're creating a thrombus, really. <laughs> that's what the thrombin does. And that's really the way you know, uh, sclerotherapy works, you're creating a thrombus. And for that matter, that's how band ligation really works, is you're trying to create a thrombus by strangulating off the flow. So um, the problem really, I think, is recanalization uh, with thrombin. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if the, if the walls scar down of the barracks before the thrombin dissolves, then you're good but you don't know that you're going, to, and as you know, gastric variceal bleeding is a toy toss, uh, toss uh, that you know, can be uh, uh, fatal. And uh, when they bleed, they, be, they bleed bad. Um, so that's my comment there. Uh, you know, I just wanted to make one other comment about aliquot. So this was, uh, I think the question earlier on, how much do you inject in one in with one injection, one aliquot? And there, I think you want to limit it, uh, again, to minimize the risk of embolization. So I'll inject one milliliter. And uh, so I place typically two coils now, and then one milliliter. And then I might, I'll wait, and you have to wait at least five minutes with the dermabond, but I'll see if the Doppler flow is gone. And if it's not gone, well, then I'll inject another milliliter, but I'll do it in aliquots, not all in just one stream. So Ken, you might want to comment about uh, with uh, Ken C, <laughs> comment on uh, using radial versus linear for uh, liver anatomy. I guess yeah, that no, was the question. yeah. As I mentioned, the linear is is really the best for liver anatomy. Yeah, you can get to every segment, every uh, vessel. Um, it's it's really ideal. So I have a question. Can for... I, I guess that's partly due to the uh, the, the fact that um, linear uh, EOS gets you better depth, uh, you know, with better resolution as well, isn't it? Yep. And if I could go back to uh, Ken Moller again, so fantastic answer. Uh, now, in terms of I know you know the standard of care uh, that we have is more of an IR approach, going for either uh, so rather than treating the tip of an iceberg going for uh, treating the underlying etiology and maybe just trying to uh, crack the whole portal hypertension system with either TIPS or BRTO. Now, uh, because that stands as a standard of care and uh, because that's where the comfort level is. So in some ways, endohepatology is pushing the limits and boundaries. So yes, we will be out of our comfort zone for a few months, years to come before it becomes a standard of care. So I think that's where I would really like to hear what your point of view is when you compare. So as an endohepatologist, so I, I'm a hepatologist and I do ERCPs in the US. So as an endohepatologist, when you're looking at, you're looking at the whole disease process, you're trying to address if you can address the underlying portal hypertension by using non-selective beta blockers, is the uh, gastric viruses are because of serotic or non-serotic portal hypertension. So you have to have a whole pragmatic approach rather than just uh, focusing on the two that you have available in hand. And I think, again, uh, I think Ken Chang, I'm, I'm, I, I, as I said, I love you all, gents. I've honestly been following you on, and I've been on Ken Chang's courses for these uh, portal pressure gradient measurements. And I think he nicely demonstrated when he went through the portal vein, through and through, and then sort of brought the needle back and to be honest, those are quite hairy moments. And I would really be, so in, how could, so when you're aspiring to set up a service, how could you reassure uh, your IR and other colleagues in terms of the complications? So if you could maybe share your experience of complications and how to avoid those things happening, especially the subcapsular or uh, intrapatic bleeds if possible. Thank you. Yeah, no, great, great questions. 
Um, in terms of complications, uh, so far I've done over 120 uh, EUS portal pressure gradient measurements, and uh, most of them uh, with uh, liver biopsy simultaneously. And so far, knock on wood, I've had zero bleeding complications or infectious complications. Uh, not that they're not possible, but uh, uh, you, you, there are some tips and tricks that you can employ. One of the great uh, tips that I would like to share with you all is when you do a liver biopsy with a 19 gauge, um, you know, before you take your needle out, uh, irregardless of how many actuations you make, but with with the with the needle in the liver before you pull the liver out, always turn on the e-flow Doppler to see if there's any flow in the needle track. Usually, if you wait one minute, two minutes, three minutes, the flow will stop and you can safely pull out the needle. But in the event that there is still flow in the needle track, and we actually submitted an abstract to DDW about this, uh, there are some things you can do uh, to uh, before, until we get to the point where we have gel foam, the steps you can take is you can wait two, three minutes. And then after that, you can slowly pull the needle out and pull it back in a zigzag path so that the blood has less chance of following you through a crooked path. But the other thing that you can do is you can take your stylet, put it back in the needle, push, push back the content of your needle about 25% push it back into the needle track. And uh, because the blood in the needle um, co uh, coagulates faster in the needle than in the liver, because there's no flow in your needle, the needle temperature is lower, it's in, inside metal. And so you likely will have a clot in your needle and you may have a little bit of liver. You push the stylet back in and all of that, uh, essentially it's a blood patch, goes back in the needle track. and. Uh, it, you know, in three cases out of hundreds, uh, it, it really saved my, my you know what, uh, because it stopped the bleeding and I could safely pull out the needle. And also, uh, I didn't have to uh, go a second pass because there was still enough specimen in the needle. Uh, so, so that is one, you know, safety maneuver. Um, obviously, bleeding, uh, platelet count, INR, you have to be careful. Um, a portal vein thrombosis is theoretically possible with a needle in the portal vein. Uh, so far, we've not seen it, uh, you know, but it, it is possible. Uh, so I, I think uh, if we approach it carefully and, and very intentionally, uh, we're going to find that endohepatology will continue to progress nicely. Great answer, Ken. Thank um, you. I just want to find out, um, have your hepatologists uh, all switched over to US guided liver biopsies because uh, when we discussed with them, uh, their main concern was whether we could actually beat the percutaneous needle because the percutaneous needles are usually bigger, 18 or 16 gauge. And um, they always uh, uh, wonder if the fragmentation would it be a problem for them to interpret it. So have your hepatologists all been very satisfied and are, are you going to switch over all their percutaneous cases over to you? Yeah, uh, Ken, uh, there, there's also a, a Sorry, the, uh, there's also a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Gish, uh, who, who's a huge figure in hepatitis B, I, I remember, uh, also about the, you know, the, the same uh, issue, uh, you know, uh, needle uh, biopsy width and uh, the, um, the, the standardization or at least the requirement uh, in, in the, the, perhaps the more recent uh, guideline of the ASLD for 20 portal, complete portal tracks. Um, you know, narrower needle versus the um, the bigger, I guess, 16 gauge, uh, which is perhaps the standard for percutaneous now. How do you see the this competing uh, with with that in the overall scheme of things? Yeah, so uh, Bob uh, actually, Bob Gish actually interacted with us in a recent workshop. Uh, so always good to hear his perspective. Uh, obviously. You know, there's length and there's width, and width is important. Uh, the the key key item is the number of complete portal tracks, and you know, with single pass, multiple actuations, you can get incredible number of complete portal tracks. Uh, so I, I and and we have the ability of uh, sampling right lobe and left lobe. 
So in PVC, there's quite a bit of variability. Some of the, hep the viral hepatitis, there may be variability. So we have the advantage of bilobar uh, biopsy, which is, which is an advantage. In terms of convincing our hepatologists, well, ignoring the fact that I'm the boss of the hepatologist, that didn't factor at all. <laughs> but aside, aside, from, aside from that, uh, it really took a few years of convincing. Initially, they were like, no, no, your, your, your specimen are fragmented. You know, this is no good. And as we evolved our technique and as the needles got better and better, uh, now after a number of years, our hepatologists actually prefer EOS lipid biopsy. The patients are much more comfortable. They get discharged much quicker, uh, less chance of bleeding. And uh, even our liver pathologists prefer EOS guided from, uh, from percutaneous or transjugular. So it is a very, hepatologists are uh, suspicious by nature, and they're not going to just jump, <laughs> jump, jump on this uh, bandwagon. Uh, so it's going to take, uh, you know, uh, data convincing, and it's a slow uh, evolution. But uh, once, you, once you package everything together, the endoscopy, the uh, shear wave, the portal pressure, the liver biopsy, now you're adding value and it's, uh, and it's efficient and, uh, and it's uh, effective. And I think that's what uh, eventually will win the day. Can I, um, can, can just, I, uh, just to... I'm sorry, Chris, sorry. You, you, go, you get hit a bit, I'll go after. Okay, I was going to ask you, Ken, just to follow on with that. I mean, for the whole suite of, of, um, of procedures, how long does that one patient have to stay with you in the room? And what, what do you end up billing for, for that? I mean, it, it's a lot of things and, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes to a lot of money, but uh, clearly yeah. Uh, there, there will be cost effectiveness questions uh, asked. Uh, it's actually about it. quite efficient. Yeah, obviously the EGD, you know, is quick. And then EOS, you, you yeah. assess, uh, you know, the, the liver by imaging in, in just a few minutes. Um, and then the shear wave takes about three to five minutes. Um, and then okay. the portal pressure takes about 15 minutes. And then the liver biopsy, depending on single or bilobe, takes another 10 minutes. So you know, 30 to 40 minutes, it's not bad. Yeah, that's very impressive. That's actually not bad at all. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm going to be... I'm, yeah. Will the insurance system allow you to bill for all of these things? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> As as the, as innovators, we, we 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 worry about that later. But anyway, no. Uh, ser in all seriousness, obviously the endoscopy is built for, the EOS is built for. If you do a liver biopsy, that's built for. Uh, the shear wave is not billable right now, and the portal pressure is an unlisted code. So those are gratis right now. I mean, we have we have charges for unlisted codes, and but a lot of times that doesn't get reimbursed. But if you roll everything up, it, it does okay. Um, and eventually, you know, we'll get, like POEM does not have a CPT code. So, you know, we're doing a lot of that as well. So, yeah, I, I think eventually we'll get a CPT code for portal pressure. We'll get a CPT code for shear wave. And, and then, it, you know, it'll fall in, into a financially, you know, reasonable situation. But even now we're, we're better than break even. And and so and it's really helping our patients. I um I, I like to comment a little bit on the size of the uh, of the needle um, we, that we use for our liver biopsy. I I can see I can see the reasons why the hepatologists are very concerned about the size of the needle, and I think it is part of it is because there was a study assessing the uh, utility of an 18 gauge needle doing uh, in terms of doing the liver biopsy through percutaneous in patients with viral hepatitis. And that study shows that an 18 gauge needle underestimate the um, activity and the uh, stage of the disease in viral hepatitis. And the reason I'm saying that is, is because I've been trying to convince my hepatologist colleagues as well 
to send patients to me for US data liver biopsy. But, uh, you know, they always mentioned about the size of the needle and the concerns that they have, because, um, you know, the biggest size of the needle we have would be an 18 gauge. Having said that, though, at least in, in our country um, these days, patients with viral hepatitis, they uh, may not need um, biopsies in terms of assessing the um, disease activity or uh, advance of the disease anymore. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that um, if we can demonstrate to them that EUS guided liver biopsy using a 19 gauge needle can make the diagnosis, and can assess disease activity as well as the, the stage of the disease in, in patients with different liver diseases, for example, NASH, which is something that, that Ken has been working on uh, for many years. I, I think that when we provide them with that data in this type of patient population, which is going to be a big problem in Asia as well, I think we'll be able to convince our hepatology colleagues more to, um, to be acceptable to EUS guided liver biopsies. So the other thing is, as I said, as a hepatologist, there's an ongoing battle among ourselves. So it's not about <laughs> convincing, it's also about convincing ourselves and convincing the world outside. Uh, could I please ask you to comment on, I think one of, the, one of the problems with the fragmentation is also how the tissue is expressed. And if your tech is, and the team is well-trained to ensure that the tissue is properly expressed, as you said, obviously, the question comes down when you're sitting down in histopathology meeting is oh, how many tracks or portal tracks did you manage to get in your biopsy? And I think in some ways, rather than assessing at the diagnosis, people are sort of commenting on the number of portal tracks that you've managed to uh, biopsy. So I, I wonder how you, your technique is or what your experience is uh, in terms of tissue expression uh, leading to tissue fragmentation. Yes, I mean, uh, tissue handling is actually very important. Uh, you've seen my videos, I, I'm kind of anal in terms of how I handle tissue. But uh, yeah, so expressing out of the needle, uh, the best way is to flush it. Uh, that's the gentlest on the, on the specimen. But sometimes if it's clotted and you know uh, flushing is not moving anything, then I will put the stylet back and just push the stylet enough so I get just a few drops out of the needle and then I'll go back to flushing. Uh, you know, then I've kind of unplugged the toilet and I can flush again. <laughs> so <laughs> analogy, but, um, and then once it's expressed out of the needle, I, I, I flush it all into one little container or, or well, and then I, I use uh, just the 18 gauge needle and just uh, tease out the specimen uh, and then put it onto filter paper and, and put that on a cassette. So I actually take care to get all the specimen as intact as possible with no further fragmentation. And I put it on a cassette so that the entire specimen is blood clot free and all on the same plane. And so when it's paraffinized and the microtome cuts the specimen, every bit of liver is on every single slide uh, and the pathologists appreciate the extra effort. Okay. Well, and going back to your uh, one of your other analogy, uh, which I remember you used in the past, and that is, um, and I've used it quite successfully, the colleagues, that when you put somebody on, on uh, antihypertensives and you then go on to make sure that you check their blood pressure regularly, whereas in the world of hepatology, you put them on non-selective beta blockers and never bother to check their PPGs. And I think that is another really good analogy and I think uh, another good way of convincing colleagues around you. Yeah, and, you know, and the, the fact that we can actually do serial measurements you would never do serial, you know, transjugular HVPG. Absolutely. Just it would never. It, they've they've tried. It doesn't fly. Uh, but with EOS guided, you can actually do serial. You know, and then in the obesity world, if you can show pre and post whatever you you know weight loss maneuver, uh, that's you know that's you know that's the you know the the key outcome, right? Uh, if you can change the portal pressure as well as your liver biopsy, uh, you, you know, you, your intervention has paid off. So the fact that we can do serial measurements, uh, whether it's not selective beta blocker or, or weight reduction or antifibrotic or any other agent, antiviral, uh, we, can, we can do serial measurements and that's a, a great advantage for us. 
Uh, one point I want to highlight, uh, especially for Prof. Prof. Cheng, earlier you mentioned in your talks, I think in a uh, Chinese university, palpation of the liver during EUS. So when I listen uh, to that comment from you, just um, how you uh, develop that scale or any tips or tricks for that? Sorry, the level of the, what did you say? Sorry. Oh, you can palpate the liver during EUS. Oh. So feel yeah, of yeah. the liver. Yeah. And uh, earlier you mentioned yeah. in your talk in Chinese university. So after listening right. to that talk, I was also starting to doing that. Uh, so yeah. your tips and tricks. What yeah. do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love palpating the liver with EUS. Uh, so if you position yourself imaging the left lobe, uh, really up against segment two that Damien showed us. Uh, so your, your, uh, your transducer is already uh, in a slightly angled position. And then if you turn your big knob severely and then it angles up, it's actually uh, pushing up against the left lobe and that's your palpation. And you can actually see the liver, a normal liver indent uh, quite nicely reacting to your big knob going up. Uh, in a cirrhotic liver, it does not indent; it it just pushes away, and just just a really uh, you know poor man's uh, palpation or liver liver assessment. Okay, great. Hmm. So we have three more minutes hmm. for discussion before we move on to the quiz. So, well, if if I can ask, can can be can be Moller a, a a technical question. So um, in my experience, my limited experience with the U.S. guided variceal treatment. So what happens is that I always go with um, EGD guided um, uh, glue injection or, or banding first. And when I fail, then I would try to uh, depend on the U.S. But what really happens at that moment is that blood is everywhere. Everything is so messy. So. <laughs> What would be your advice in terms of how to 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 better manage the situation? Should I even not try doing regular endoscopy at all, or what? What, what would you um, mm -hmm. what would you advise me on that? Oh, Ken, can I think you're muted? Can you you are muted? Yeah. Good. Here yes, now I'm unmuted. Good. Okay. Yeah. Here, here's the way I think you need to think of this. Don't think of these things as competitive. They're complementary. It's just a different set of eyes. So we have endoscopy. That's one set of eyes. Then we have ultrasound. That's another set of eyes. We have fluoroscopy. Another set. These are imaging modalities. That's all. So we use these selected based on the sort of the information okay. that we want to get. You can hear me, right? Uh, am I still yeah, hear you? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. good. Yeah. So uh, now, specifically in terms of... Hello? Okay. So in terms of the uh, the debate, whether to do endoscopy guided versus US guided, uh, there I think... The main issue for me is has to do just with how blind the procedure really is. And one thing is for sure, with endoscopic guidance, Unmuted. you're not going to see the feeder vessel. If you can target the feeder vessel, you're going to be able to be way more effective in obliterating the convolute of varices that that feeder vessel feeds. So you're really getting more bang for the buck, if you will. So I try to look, or spend time looking for that feeder vessel, and you'll find it. You'll see it traversing the wall. And if you target that vessel and you inject your glue, I will place a coil first. But if you target it that way, then you're going to see that that convolute that you see then endoscopically, that's more on the surface, it's in the submucosa, right? So you really don't necessarily see it that well for gastric varices compared to esophageal varices, which are in the lamina propria. So for the lamin, for esophageal varices, I agree. I mean, would you use EUS to do that? No, you see them beautifully. They're violaceous. You can see exactly where the varices are. And even though there were studies, this is maybe over 10 years ago, that showed that if you targeted the perforator vein 
under EUS guidance versus doing endoscopic treatment. At that time, it was sclerotherapy. The outcomes were significantly better in terms of recurrence of bleeding, which sort of makes sense because you're actually getting the root of the problem. But still, I don't think it's necessary because we all know we have great results with band ligation today. So there really isn't a need to fix something that's not broke. But I think with gastric varices, it's a different story. So the fact that you can see the feeder vessel, target the feeder vessel, and it's simply way less blind. I mean, you have to recognize that sometimes these varices remain undiagnosed because they're interpreted to be gastric folds, or sometimes they're misdiagnosed as sub epithelial tumors, like a gist. Turns out it's a big varix, and obviously you don't want to go biopsying that. So it's there, there's, these are lessons you learn along the way, and you gain appreciation for the information that EUS or ultrasound provides. But again, think of it always as complementary. It's not excluding the other. After all, it's an echo endoscope. So there's both the word echo in there and endo. So you got both modalities at your disposal. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So uh, I think we can. Ken, could you take us through the, the way that you identify these um, these feeder vessels uh, into the large gastric varices. I, I know that you've made the point very well that uh, in, in your studies that uh, and others have done that as well, that uh, you use far less glue and coils when, when, when you can target these vessels. How do you reliably find them? Well, you look actually, what you need to train your eye to see is the muscularis propria which of course we look for when we stage uh, cancers, right? We're looking for a T2 mm -hmm. stage versus T3 stage. So you look for the MP and once you identify the MP, you just follow that. And now you're looking for the vessel that is going through the wall there. And you will see there's an extra intestinal component or extra mural component. And there will be lots of collaterals and you'll see the splenic vein and you'll see, you know, you may see gastrorenal shunts then. And uh, then on the inside, and you'll see that much better if you just put water, fill the fundus with water. Then literally the varices sort of float. <laughs> so it's an underwater, an ultrasound underwater view of these varices. So it's really not hard. You just have to train your eye to look for that transition between the intramural versus the extramural. And then I would just target it right there where it's going through the wall. Thank, thanks very much. Is, is, do you find that there's any value in using contrast uh, before I, you, you, uh, you place the first coil? I don't. Um, I think the rationale for using contrast was to differentiate the afferent from the efferent. But mm -hmm. honestly, I can, I can see just with the Doppler where the which direction the flow seems to be going. And I seem to be pretty good because I usually see that the flow is going into the barracks. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, I, I don't use the contrast. I think the role of the contrast could be, there's some studies showing that if you can reduce the flow a certain amount before putting with a coil, I should say, before injecting the glue, your outcomes may be better. See, I'm just putting the, the coil in there and I'm just eyeballing it. And I just want to see that there's something in the lumen that will be a scaffold, serve as a scaffold to retain the glue. And, you know, if you really look carefully and you switch on the Doppler, then you may appreciate that things kind of swirl more as a result of the coil being in there. But if you really wanted to do things scientifically, then you would inject some contrast and sort of see how quickly the contrast flows out after you put the coil. And that's always intrigued me, except I do these procedures in a non-floral room. So I'd have to you know, bring the patient and set, set it up for floral. And um, I get enough radiation from my ERCP, so. <laughs> Dr. Chris, we are running Thank out you. of time now. So can we move okay. on to a quick uh, quiz? Um, so. Sure. 
So, uh, for the uh, so this is the first question, and the you can answer in the chat chat box, and the first correct answer in the chat uh, chat box will get the prize. So, which needle is most suitable for US guided labor biopsy? Option A, 22 gauge FNA, 20B, 22 gauge FNB needle. Option C, 22 gauge FNB needle. Option D, 19 gauge FNA needle, or option E, 19 gauge FNB needle. So these are all locally available uh, needles. <laughs> so we have the answer, so we move on to the next uh, slide. The next question <laughs> is related to anatomy. So uh, we have five options over there. So there are three uh, liver segments, one, two, and five. And there are two vascular structures, three and four. So identify the correct uh, order in A, B, C, D, and E. <laughs> yes. So we have the answers for that. So um, that's the end of the quiz, and uh, I can uh, before I, we conclude, uh, just concluding remarks from the chairs first for this session, um, Dr. Chris and Dr. Nantley. Um, I, I I guess we I apologize if the the discussion has been uh, too centered too much on 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 uh, endoscopy, but uh, I just. Need, need to remind us as, as uh, you know uh, that, that this is part of a hepatology meeting uh, but I, I think we have shown uh, I mean the speakers have have very um, you know well ably illustrated the the, the, the utility of, of EOS in, in many aspects of hepatology some of which were really not available b before especially uh, when it comes to EUS uh, guided uh, um, you know, vascular, uh, hep liver vascular diagnostics and therapy. Uh, but, um, th but this, this uh, to me, uh, as a non-hepatologist at least, uh, um, does help to, 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 to demonstrate the, the point that uh, there, there is a lot of common ground between uh, endoscopists and hepatologists uh, in, 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 in moving forward from today or, or from now. Yeah, and uh, uh, to add to Chris' comments, I, I really, I really like to thank all the speakers, um, the shares, my co-chair Chris, and I think this was an excellent symposium. Even I myself learned a lot. We've got, you know, um, the great opportunity to be sharing our experiences uh, with with um, world experts in the field, and I think that the audience will now um, uh, understand and realize that. EUS is emerging and it can be very helpful. It can be an alternative method in investigating and treating patients with liver diseases. And with that, I'd like to conclude the session and thank you very much PSSLD for having us together and giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank Bye you everyone. Guys. Thank Great you. seeing you all. Yep. Thank you. Bye. 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 So Bye. it's a midnight in California. Bye. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. So, Dr. Adil, thank sure. you very much, everyone. Yeah. So, Dr. Adil, when you were, like, uh, uh, showing us the quiz, we were noticing who's the winner. So, Professor Robert Gish actually won the first prize, but the runner-up was Dr. <laughs> Sajid. And we thought that Dr. Uh, Robert Gish will not mind if he gave this prize to Sajid, Dr. Sajid. So for the second question, Dr. Amda Salamat gave the correct answer and the, he's the winner of the second quiz. So a decent amount of cash prize will be sent to you shortly. So in every next session at the end, we'll be having these quizzes related to the talks related to for that symposium. So just please listen the talks and give the correct answer and win the prizes. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.